Dark Souls, a series renowned for its fantastic combat, rolling, parrying, and blocking, not to mention amazing weapons. But let's focus on a certain one. You know, rolling's fun, parrying's fun, and all the cool weapons are nice too. But what if we just used a shield? The rules are as follows. The only direct damage I can inflict is with a shield. Non-damaging spells and items are allowed. Any summons used must use only shields. And NPC quest lines are fair game. So, let's start with Dark Souls 1. Starting out, we name our character Heater. Male, deprived class. With the old witch's ring. In the Undead Asylum, we don't have a shield until about halfway through, so we just run past everything. We also run past a perfect depiction of me. Here's where we get our shield. We go ahead and test out our moveset. We have a bash and a running bash. Both horrible options, but it'll have to do for now. We do very little damage to even the hollows here. Hopefully the upcoming boss isn't too tough. We don't have any options at this point. Yeah, 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 just give me the flask already. Come on. It's time for the Asylum Demon. The plunging attack will give us a great head start. With little damage, this fight is going to be tough. Not that the Asylum Demon is going to kill me, but we do trade some hits. Eventually, we do take him down, and we learn something. Shields have block frames. While you're attacking, you can block an attack if you time it right. I actually didn't know this. This is crazy. Like it's not it's not a good mechanic, but it's it's still crazy. Eventually, we do exit the asylum and make it to Lordran. Alright, so right before the Berg, we're not doing any damage. 12 damage per hit on these hollows. I mean, it takes very long to kill these guys. Alright, we make it to Undead Bird. We get a slightly better shield. Apparently the plank shield isn't a wooden shield, but I don't care. I'm doing more damage, and that's what matters. It's time for the Taurus Demon. My initial plan was to run up to the tower after we kill the archers, because it's a better spot to fight him. We don't do much damage. The Taurus Demon has over a thousand HP, and we only do 15 damage per hit, which means 81 hits to kill this guy. After a long fight, we do go down, getting to about a third health. We decide to try it again. I'm confident this time. So, we end up dying to the Undead Archers, but we try it again. And the same thing happens. We give it one more shot. It goes pretty much the same way. So, we visit the Undead Merchant and pick up a better shield, the Heater Shield. We kindle the bonfire and decide to give the boss another try. With our heater shield, 
plunging attacks can hit twice sometimes. The fall damage and lack of a normalized animation are worth it for the damage. After a few plunging attacks and some regular ones, he does go down. Oh hey, what's going on? Nice shield you got there. Can I have it? What? I don't want this. No, give me your shield. No, no, give me your shield. God, that guy was so mean. He doesn't even give me his shield. Just makes me wanna... Ugh. Oh hey, this ladder fell. That's nice. After dying to the Drake... Twice. Three times, actually. We make it to the Undead Parish. We do not fight anybody here. It's not worth the souls, or the weapon durability, honestly. After coming across and dispelling the Balder Knight, we pick up the Night Shield, yet another upgrade. And we make it to the bonfire. And we make it to the bonfire. We kindle this bonfire, as is tradition. Hi, Andre. Bye, Andre. You know what time it is. The Bell Gargoyles are interesting. We do a pretty decent chunk of damage with our plus two Night Shield. And since this is an early game boss, they're not too hard to dodge either. We make it far on our first attempt, but the Gargoyles do end up killing us. We go back to Firelink to upgrade our Estus Flask, and give it another shot. Despite relatively high damage, the way we're forced to fight these Gargoyles just takes a long time, especially when there's two of them. There are very little opportunities to actually get a hit in, and we can only get one or two, making this fight take forever. Giving it another try now, this early boss can't be that hard. Falling off the roof seemed to be a sign, because this was the beginning of a rut that took hours to get out of. Getting to the boss itself started to become a problem. I never killed the caster here, and so these hollows did a lot of damage. Even if we didn't take damage, we were likely to get stuck on them, because taking the time to kill them means the others catch up. When we make it to the boss itself, the fight isn't easy. Low damage means high execution and a couple of mistakes is all it takes to die. We died a lot here. And the caster even buffed the gargoyles? Safe to say I let them kill me pretty fast. The very next attempt though, things are going pretty well. One goes down, the other does too after a bit of trouble. And with that, the first Bell of Awakening is rung. Hi, Andre. Bye, Andre. We run pleading for our lives into the lower on Deadburg, barely hanging by a thread. We grab our first real armor here, and make sure that we maintain fast roll. Capra Demon doesn't get less badly designed than the usual here. The beginning of this fight is always a crapshoot, and this attempt is no different. 
blood loss is procced, and we're barely living in this fight. Stop. I'm on the back foot here, cornered, and about to get comboed. I start to weigh my options. I could roll, but I'm likely to take damage. How about a heavy attack with block frames? Now, it's just the Capra Demon. He's relatively easy to just walk around. And with that decisive blow, the Capra Demon goes down first try. Radiating confidence, I die to some random hollow assassins. We open the shortcut back to Firelink, and show Lawtrek some real favor and protection, before swiping his ring. Into the depths now, we experience an alternate universe of my recent Capra Demon fight, and grab the best helmet in the game. We free Laurentius, kill the caster, and take on the gaping dragon. This fight is absolutely the dumbest in the whole game for this challenge. We deal 21 damage per hit, and the gaping dragon has 4,401 hit points, resulting in 210 hits in order to kill him. This fight took 23 minutes and I'll leave the full thing in the description if you're curious. The tale alone took me 13 minutes. For people who value at least a little bit of their time, I'm just going to show you how long it took me to get rid of one health segment. Hi, Andre. Bye, Andre. Welcome to Blight Town, the area of enemies I didn't bother fighting. Making it to Quaylag, an iconically tanky boss. We actually make it far on our first attempt, but go down to some questionable hitboxes. The very next attempt, though, she goes down pretty easy. With this, the second bell of awakening is rung, giving us access to Sen's fortress. Hi, Andre. Bye, Andre. In Sen's fortress, we grab the tower shield from the crestfallen merchant and get its plus eight. Go get yourself. My plan for the iron golem was to fight him on the thin bridge, due to the giant being a very difficult enemy to kill. Needless to say, it does not go well. We decide to eliminate the firebombs in a more peaceful way. We have the giant destroy all his firebombs, and subsequently get a goodbye hug that lasts a little too long. But we have access to a much easier iron golem fight. This is yet another slot, and I'm sensing a theme. This fight takes 12 minutes, and again, I'll leave the last part of it uncut as a demonstration.
we wave goodbye to the giant and get abducted to Anorlando. After facing my past trauma and a largely unoffendful area, Ornstein and Smo are up next. This fight has very little opportunities for damage and is the hardest by far. This is a clip that demonstrates what I mean. Ornstein never strays very far from Smo and the large startup and end lag on my attacks, not to mention abysmal damage, leads this fight to have a very low possibility of being possible. Eventually, I started blocking, because it's easier than dodging, leading to taking less damage, even if the pace slows further as a result. After maybe an hour of attempts, we make it to Super Smo, and we die without much fanfare. I decide Smo has to die instead of Ornstein. And Super Ornstein isn't a problem. Just stay close and dodge a couple attacks. The fight remains at the pace of a snail, but eventually, and I mean eventually, this fight took forever. We kill Super Ornstein. That's the first time I've ever done this, actually. I always kill Ornstein first. We face another problem though, that we can't kill Guinevere. So we head to the demon ruins where we grave rob this guy's dead sister and throw him off a cliff. With the discharge down, we get to the fire sage. Oh shit, we forgot to place the lord vessel. After doing so, on the way back we grab power within and attempt the Fire Sage. After doing essentially zero damage, I'm fed up and decide it's time for something else. Welcome to the Catacombs. We get parried and make it to our farming spot. We want the Bone Wheel Shield, and judging by how much I died, this thing better be powerful. Eventually, we get it. This shield's heavy attack gets three times, and we can do a silly little block spam. Upgrading it to plus five, it's already better than the other shields we've used. Hi, Andre. Bye, Andre. With our newfound power, we give the Fire Sage another try. We do a comparatively big chunk of damage now, but die after a long fight. But, the Fire Sage isn't that tough after all. Hi, Giant Blacksmith. Bye, Giant Blacksmith. Demon Centipede concerned me initially. But we shred this guy, and this fight turns into a joke. We ignore the Isolith and hit the bed of chaos three times to kill it. That's one lord sold down, three to go. After farming chunks, we upgrade to the lightning bone wheel shield plus one. Hi, giant blacksmith. Bye, giant blacksmith. Now, this is an issue, pinwheel. Pinwheel is so difficult in this run, due to the high health pool he has and the insane damage output. I don't know if this run is even possible because of him. After dying to his goons, we try Nito again. This fight quickly turned into managing a rapidly declining health bar, with Power Within and Toxic both draining me. Nito seems to go down as fast as my health did during this fight. Seath is up next, and after denying him the glory of killing our character, we run through the motions that this area requires. Our fight with Seath is uneventful, because he goes down so fast. Hi, 
Hi, giant blacksmith. Bye, giant blacksmith. The moonlight butterfly is our easiest boss yet. Sif is up, and she goes faster down than I thought she would. We equip Havel set and win the DPS race against the Four Kings. Starting a fire large enough to burn down an apartment complex, we get to Gwyn and promptly fail to parry. I embrace my inner rock and Havel tank it with a shield. Okay, this part's unscripted, but I think Dark Souls 1 was really challenging in the first half. I mean, the Bell Gargoyles, and, and especially the Gaping Dragon. Because while I did it first try, it was just a really long fight. I think the Bone Wheel Shield made things a little bit too easy, which is why I hung off on getting it at least to the second half of the game. I could have just done it without it, but it would have taken way too much effort. And honestly, the Four Kings would have been a big challenge. Otherwise, though, it wasn't that bad. I mean, this could be a pretty fun run for someone to do if they just grab the Bone Wheel Shield pretty fast. But we still have two games to do, so let's see how that goes. In honor of our first character, we named this one Bone Wheel. We choose the Warrior class with the Life Ring, because the Warrior is the only one with the shield. We decide to create what I think the average Dark Souls 2 Enjoyer looks like. Welcome to Majula. We grab our Estus flask and punish the blacksmith for being lame. We then cheese the dragon rider, although it takes a while because I suck at doing this. We cheese the anti-cheese mechanic and make it to the first real bonfire. This area is interesting. We end up dying in some really creative ways. Eventually, we make it to the last giant. We don't do much damage here, but let's give it a try anyway. I've done less damage on harder bosses. Despite a pretty long fight, especially for our first boss, we die. We decide to summon Luit, because he does only use shields, so he fits the criteria for this run. He does not do anything, so we banish him and return home. We decide to try again. And this time, we go it alone. Let's see how it goes.
Nice. That's a good start to our run. Two bosses down with little trouble. Aw, oh, shit. We grab the Ring of Restoration and take on the Pursuer. Now, as anyone who's played Dark Souls 2 will know, the Ballista absolutely destroys this guy. So, we fire it at him once and take out his remaining health. And the Pursuer goes down, first try. God damn it. We ride the DS1 reference all the way to the Lost Bastille, where we immediately leave. On to good old No Man's Wharf. We pull the lever, avoid everyone, and take on the Flexile Sentry. We do even less damage than to the last giant here. So we leave. We open up McDuff's workshop and get a better shield, the Royal Kite Shield. Let's see how this shield does. Good damage. This is doable, as long as the water doesn't rise. With the amount of damage we do, and this boss's huge weakness to mobility. The water ends up rising, because this fight still takes a long time. But, after a few missed hits on both sides, we do take down the Flexile Sentry. Now on the other side of the Lost Bastille, we take on the Ruin Sentinels. We do good damage here, but this is a triple boss fight, and fighting two of them at once is not going to be as easy as it's just one. The first one goes down, but the other two start to cause problems, and we die. We give it a few more tries. One attempt makes it far. Another attempt is blundered. And finally, after a lot of tries, one is successful. With the Sentinels dead, we can finally see straight. And we get the Dragon Rider Great Shield. We immediately upgrade this to plus one and take on the Belfry Gargoyles. We do a good amount of damage to them. And so they go down, first try. Wait, no, don't look at the Covenant. No, don't look at the Covenant. No, cut away, cut away. We prepare for the Lost Center and take her on. where we die. We didn't get a hit in, but we try again. Figuring out how much damage we do, this is doable. And she dies. And she dies on our second attempt. That's one great soul down. Onto the Shaded Woods and to Najka. We half cheese and half kill this boss resulting in a first try kill again. Past the weird Covenant area, we're under the Royal Rat Authority, one of the worst bosses in this series. The dogs toxic us on our first attempt, and we die not much later. On our second attempt, we kill the dogs. Now it's just the main boss. With that abomination of game design down, we move forward. Brightstone Cove is boring, so we make it to the Magus. And honestly, what do you expect out of this fight? It's easy. Pushing forward, we get invaded by another shield only player. I'm going to let most of this fight play out.
With the invader killed, and my originality brought into question, we skip the spiderweb area and take on Freya. And I hate Freya. Specifically the laser attack when you're trying to kill these little guys. And eventually, after quite a few attempts, the Duke's dear Freya is taken down. And so is the Duke. That's our second great soul. Hopefully the next two aren't too hard. The Huntsman's Copse is uneventful, as every other area is. And we take on the Chariot. Which goes as normal as every other chariot fight. And, as always, the Executioner's Chariot goes down first try. Now to Gank City. With one of my favorite bosses down, we make it to Earth and Peak and join the Best Covenant. Of all bosses we could have died to, of all the bosses we could have died to, we chose the Covetous Demon. No, I'm not joking. After getting trapped in a corner, we died to the Covetous Demon. On our next attempt, he goes down like he's a normal enemy. Honestly, this boss is not difficult. I can't believe I cannot lie when I say I died to the Covetous Demon in Dark Souls 2. I just can't believe it. Anyway, moving up Earth and Peak. I commit the best crime, arson. And we move to Mytha. Now, this fight is about as easy as the Covetous Demon. The only difference here is we don't die to her. And she goes down first try. Now, on to a more janky area. The Iron Keep. The Iron Keep has a lot of dudes. And whether you find them easy or hard, the sheer number of the Elan Knights makes this area very difficult. And so after fighting our way through some of the people, and praying we don't get shot out of the fog door animation, we make it to the Smelter Demon fight. Now, this guy's attacks aren't difficult. He mostly did the same thing for phase one. And in phase two, he did a multitude of attacks, none of which were particularly hard to dodge or out heal. In phase three, he makes it even harder on us. Despite using over 20 life gems, we eventually deplete the Smelter Demon's health bar. And he goes down first try. We head back after making it to the bonfire for the pursuer here because he has the Ring of Blades plus one, which is an increase to our attack. And no, we didn't die, I don't know what you're talking about. After putting out some fire, we make it to the old Iron King. After getting knocked off, we try again. See, this boss isn't hard. We just always find a way to get knocked off. And we walked off way more than we actually died to him. But 
eventually, our third Lord Soul goes down. And we have one more to go. Take the plunge. You won't die. Onto the Grave of Saints. We get summoned, actually. Uh, I didn't expect anyone to still be playing this game. Alright, summon to the world. Tarnished? Elden Ring player? We click menu for a faster shield, because he's playing Elden Ring, and lead him into this room. Eventually, we run away, juke him out, and make it to the end of the area. Does this guy know how his covenant works? Waiting game. Hi, rats. Bye, rats. Next up is the gutter and the black gulch, which we run and skip through. Not before killing the giants here, though. I don't want to have to come back later. Other than managing my poison here initially, the rotten is as easy as it is in speedruns. And hey, with four Lord Souls down, we're moving on to Drangleg Castle. Ah! After attempting to open the door, We make it to the next bonfire. And remembering we can upgrade our shield, we upgrade it to plus three. We're taking these guys on with their own equipment. And they go down quick. I mean, this boss is really easy for this point in the game, even on challenge runs. So, the looking glass knight. The thing about this guy is he is one of my favorite boss designs. But he's easy. And so with the Looking Glass Knight down, we move on to the Shrine of Amana, an area I refuse to play correctly even to this day. You just run past everything, it's not that hard. Hi Demon of Song. Despite getting grabbed and the massive damage this guy dishes out, he goes down second try with relatively little trouble. We take the new Lundo elevator to the Undead Crypt. Seriously, this is just the exact elevator from New Lundo. Where we go- Ah! Again? After lighting a bonfire, and opening a shortcut, we take on Veldstat, one of my favorite bosses. Who we die to. But I don't have a problem trying it again. So we get our revenge. With the Royal Aegis defeated, we grab the King's Ring, leave the old man for later, and open a cool door. We light a bonfire, chop some onions, and make it to a bad boss, who we kill. Seriously, this boss is just a regular enemy in the next area. Skipping the Dragonary, we light yet another- Ah! I HATE YOU! We kill these guys with no issue. Not even this one. He goes down. We kill the ancient dragon. I'm gonna spare you the pain. This boss sucks. On to the giant memories now. We see how far we've come, because we fight the last giant too. And he goes down. We grab the rest of the giant souls. Hi, Vendrick! 
Bye, Vendrick. Guess what time it is? It's time for the DLC. After cheesing this entire DLC, one lever. Two lever. Three lever. Seriously, I refuse to fight anyone in this DLC, especially with the shield. The bosses are great, but the enemies less so, especially in Scholar. And that makes four levers. Next is the Fume Knight. After a long and tough fight, we do end up dying to some unfortunate luck. But, on our next try, after a ton of difficult attacks, The Fume Knight goes down. After making it through this very tough boss run, it's time for Sir Alon. Now, this fight was hard. Until I learned to block. Then he went down the next try. Because it doesn't matter it doesn't matter what delays he uses if you just block his attack. As long as you dodge the grab and the kick, you should be fine. Just wait for your opportunity to attack, and all should be good. So, Sirlon goes down within five tries. Sanctum, Sanctum City. City. Sanctum City. Sanctum City. This is just another DLC I run through until the bosses. Are you noticing a pattern? And Alana is easy enough. We take down the skeletons whenever they get stomached, but whenever Velstag gets stomached, we just burn her down because it's not worth it to go for him. And surprisingly, it works. And she goes down second try. Sin is hard. Despite how difficult he is, he does go down, though. Oh, what a nice path. What? Who are you? No, shut up. I'll do what I want. Yeah, I'm hungry too. After gouging someone's eyes out, we make it to Ava. And we make it pretty far on our first attempt. But we die. We die a few more times. But eventually, Ava goes down. And with her, the snowstorm. We free all three of the captured Lois Knights. And take on the Burnt Ivory King.
Apex Legends mode is is pretty boring, honestly. They should update this. But the Burnt Ivory King himself is really fun. On our first attempt, we make it shockingly close, but die to him. On our next attempt, though, we catch him buffing. And that marks our opportunity to strike. There's all of the good DLC bosses dead. On to the final three boss rush. We have the Throne Watcher and Defender. After a few prime dodges, the Throne Defender goes down, and the Watcher is not too quick to follow. Now, especially with the Hollow Skin mask on, Nishandra is a joke, and she goes down very quickly. Now, Aldia, this fight was cool the first time it happened, but this is a boring fight. And I'll show you it in most of its glory, at 10 times speed of course. And with Aldia dead, that is Dark Souls 2 beaten with only a shield. Honestly, I had the most fun with Dark Souls 2. Just messing around with the Dragon Slayer shield for the majority of the run was pretty fun. It felt like a, just a unique weapon run. It was like a strength weapon if it was bad. My favorite part of the run might have been the Bastille, just because I didn't have like a hugely good weapon. I had like, like the Silver Kaiju, like the Iron Parma sucked, but it was it was like bad in a not fun way, as opposed to the, the Kite Shield, which was fun, but it wasn't good. Once I got the Dragon Rider, Rider Shield, I kind of couldn't go back, and it just turned, I don't know, pretty easy. I, I, had, I had a pretty big amount of fun, because the Bone Wheel Shield isn't in this game, to my knowledge. I could just be wrong. But, yeah, no, I mean, it was, it was pretty fun overall. I don't think I'd recommend it with certain bosses like the Ancient Dragon or maybe the Royal Rat Authority. I don't know. I know I didn't do the co-op DLC bosses, but they're co-op bosses. They're either extremely jank or just repeats. And honestly, I don't care. If I could do one, I could do two. If I could do a... If I could do an orange smelter demon, I could do a blue smelter demon. And I have. Just don't feel like doing it, honestly. In Dark Souls 3, we start deprived and start to customize our character. We decide to go for a dark blue look, and we name him Dragon Rider in honor of our second build. We test our moveset. It's largely the same from the first game. So... We cheese this crystal lizard, and light our first bonfire, where we take on EU decks. This fight isn't too bad. Due to our shield's high poise damage, he gets staggered a lot, and that means we can give him some big damage. Phase 2 is largely the same. We stagger him repeatedly. And, with relatively little effort, the Ashen Judge is no more. We grab a new shield and shove the Swordmaster off a cliff. 
we link Firelink and level up. Then we allot our Estus before we travel to Highwall. We grab the high walled necessities before dying at this chest. We make it back here on our next attempt and pick up a good shield, a Silver Eagle Kite Shield. Vort is on the chopping block next, and he's easy with passing damage. Phase 2 is a little tough, but with my practice for my Farin Dart run, this fight becomes easy. We trade hits, and Vort falls in a very close fight. We pick up Yol, level up Endurance, and free Grey Rat because we forgot to. We pacify Hodrick, and take on a boss that really saps my energy. We make it to phase 2 on our first try. And make it pretty far. But we get grabbed, spelling the end of this attempt. Turns out the Curse Rod of Greywood is not an issue. Get it? Not? We kill the first of many demons, and encounter Curse Rod of Greywood's cousins. Hi, Sage. Bye, Sage. First try. We cheese the exiles, and grab an undead bone shard. During the Deacon's fight, we do good damage here. Way better than our Farin Dart run, so I know we can do this. And, after a little bit of effort, we get into Phase 2. Phase 2 definitely takes a lot longer, whether it's healing or just less opportunities for attack. But, the Deacons do eventually die. We put out some fire and grab the Farron Coal, where we make our Eagle Kite Shield heavy. The Abyss Watches are up next, and we do good damage here. We get carried into Phase 2, but we don't live too long after that. On our next attempt, though, the Abyss Watches go down, with relatively little trouble. After we witness power beyond our comprehension, we move forward. Hey, what a nice area. Oh boy. And Wolnir goes down. We kill a demon. Two, actually. And make it to Irithel. Oh, but wait, we forgot something. There it is. Here's our old Reliable from Dark Souls 1. We upgrade this thing to plus four before we take on Pontiff Sullivan. Pontiff is interesting. We do good damage here, but the spin attack is slow in this game. After running out of mana, we switch shields. The damage is worse, but he does die. Making it through the rest of Irithyll, we make it to Aldrich. And hey, that's some good damage. With our very powerful shield. Aldrich goes down on our first try. Sprinting through Irithyll. We make it to Yorm. Yom, old friend. I, Siegfried of the Knights of Katarina, have come to uphold my promise. 
Let the sun shine upon this Lord of Cinder. Yeah, so we picked up Sigrid. And he helps. A lot. We keep Yorm's aggro while he does the majority of the damage. And I am going to allow this, just because I do not want to fight this boss. Not after my Farandar run. Hi, Dancer. Bye, Dancer. Here's when we take on Osiris. And if there's one thing I know, this boss is always too busy yapping to kill you. In the Untended Graves, we cheese another couple Crystal Lizards, and take on the Champion. Now, this bot still has the same poise as the tutorial boss, and with a better shield we stagger him, repeatedly. He goes down on our first attempt. In Lothar Castle, we roll through some poorly designed hazards. And take on the Dragon Slayer armor, who is fun, if not hard. This boss always has very little opportunities for damage, but with good damage, it's not a problem. And he goes down on our first try. Now, it's time for the Twin Princes. This boss is very intimidating on challenge runs. But we make it to phase 2 on our first attempt. And after killing Lorien once, Lothar goes down not much later. Moving into the DLC, the champion's Grave Tender is up. And, I honestly found this boss very difficult. On our first attempt, we made it relatively far. And on our next, we make it even farther. But, we die all the same. Give another try with the same result. But finally, after five attempts, the Champion's Grave Tender and the Grave Tender's Great Wolf go down. That is the most attempts for a boss in a long time. Moving forward with this DLC, we kill Sir Wilhelm with no problem. And promptly get soft locked. Now, it's time for
we could move on to the second DLC. In the Drake Heap, we take this shortcut to make it to the Demon Prince fast. On our first attempt, Demon in Pain goes down quickly, and Demon from Below is soon to follow. The Demon Prince fight is easy too. Honestly, this build is all about your fundamentals. If you know how to dodge a boss's attacks, this build is honestly pretty good. Alright, next, we decided to go to Archdragon Peak. Why is it black? Why is there no footage? Ow. Oh. So, I lost the footage for Archdragon Peak and the rest of the DLC. I am going to show you a reenactment, but I ran out of storage because this video has taken over half a terabyte of footage. But I have a solution. I have put in a lot of effort to reenact the bosses with my build. So, without further ado, here's how it went. Uh, shit. Uh, nah. Ah, die, die. Yay. Huh. Uh. Yippee. With both DLCs and Archdragon Peak down, we move to the end of the game. And Soul of Cinder's pretty fun, actually. No matter which phase, we know when to attack. So whether it's the straight sword phase, curved sword phase, the magic phase, the spear phase, any of them. This boss does not pose an issue. And eventually, we make it to Gwyn. This boss has ample opportunities for us to heal, mainly the combo, or the grab. We find our opportunities for attacks relatively easily, and the Soul of Cinder goes down on our first attempt. With that, we become the Lord of Hollows. Gracious Lord, make so, this is definitely the most jank run. Not in terms of actual gameplay, but in terms of capturing it. We had multiple hiccups, losing footage, I had a four hour session that corrupted. And so, I'm sorry if this one's a little jank. It's, I just had a lot of issues actually putting it together. Corrupted footage and all. But the run itself was actually pretty easy. I mean, once we got even the Silver Eagle Kite Shield, things became really easy. Like, because the Bone Wheel Shield has a specific weapon skill, it honestly feels like it was meant to actually be used as a weapon. And thus, this run didn't actually, this run wasn't actually that hard. It honestly makes up for some parts of one. But, I mean, overall, I'd say this one was definitely the easiest. Overall, this run was very fun. All three games, they, they all had their own interesting and unique challenges. And I just want to say thank you so much for the response on the previous video. I made that just because, oh, I had a silly little idea in my head. And while it is still just for fun, I do... Th the intention is very encouraging. Because this is a very fun hobby. I like I like getting better at editing. I like doing little things. You know, I like putting my thoughts out there. Stuff like that. Uh, if you guys have any future ideas or plans, I mean, honestly, I'm just going to keep doing runs of whatever I want. Uh, I know I have a Titanfall 2 melee-only run up in the works right now. I have the footage recorded for it as I'm recording this audio. Uh, so it should be out pretty soon. But uh, other than that, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I'm not going to plug the like, comment, and subscribe, like I said. This is just a hobby, but, you know, I seriously appreciate people sticking around. If they want to hear whoever I am, you know, play a video game or speak about whatever, I'm here for it.
thank you guys so much. Uh, yeah, goodbye.